Okay, thank you very much for coming. Today we host uh, Mark Schneider uh, from Mega Megawatt uh, Capital. So Mark has a uh, whole degree from uh, Sydney Uni in Electrical Engineering and Science. He also has a postgrad diploma from the Securities Institute of Australia. He has large uh, experience with uh, investors, uh, investor in renewable energy. He led the different teams in different banks in Australia before we founded uh, his company, Megawatt. He has great title for his talk, so turning panels to project, it's something that I assume that all of us are interested to do. So please welcome Mark. Yeah, thank you very much um, and thank you for organising the session. Um, I, I'm hoping that we can keep things relatively informal. I have prepared a few slides, but that's just more in case um, you know we, we, we need to keep a little bit of a thread going if, if, if the discussion doesn't really gather momentum. So please feel free to, to ask me questions, you know, interrupt, argue with me. I don't really mind. I, you know, I just want to talk about the things that, are, that, you know, the insights that I can give you that will be interesting to you. So, um, you know, essentially, as, as, as you just heard, um, I, I trained as an electrical engineer. I did an honours degree at the University of, um, of Sydney. Um, and, and I remember, actually, as I was coming in here this morning, I was thinking about a lecture I remember in my final year of engineering. And um, um, it, they made us do a course at, at Sydney Uni in, in the last, the, as, as sort of a, a mini course in our last semester as undergraduates. And, and it was called Power Station Finance. And, and I remember thinking, um, of, of all the courses, this was really not what I was interested in. You know, I was much more interested in, in the real engineering, if I can use that term. And, 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 and I remember the lecturer, uh, the member of the faculty who ran this course, explaining at the start why this could well be the most important course for many of you sitting in the room. And I was very, very sceptical. So, of course, as luck would have it, within six months of finishing engineering, I was working in the banking world. Um, sorry, finishing my engineering studies, I was working in the banking world. I had a few years in the bond market, and, um, and then over 20 years working in finance and power. So, specifically where, uh, essentially what that lecture was about, about the financing of power projects. Um, for the last 10 years, so the second half of that 20 years, it's really been about renewable energy. So 1994 to 2004, um, you know, my, uh, for some of that time, for example, I was the power project specialist for the National Australia Bank and my job was to go around the world and help the National Australia Bank get loans or get the opportunity to lend money to people who own power stations. Um, so, you know, the, the great irony is that the lecture was exactly right. That was a really important lecture. And, and I know that for many of you, the topic that I'm addressing this afternoon is something quite different to what you really spend uh, most of your time on. Um, um, and I'm not going to promise that it's going to be an important lecture, but what I am going to say is that life can hold a few surprises and you never really know where, where you, you know, where your career takes you. So. Um, um, you know, hopefully I can share some insights that you find interesting in any event. So, um, j just to explain where I'm, where I'm coming from today, um, Megawatt Capital is a really small company that I set up about 12 months ago. Before that, as Ziv said, I was working in, in different organisations, but for the last, for 10 years, I worked with an Investec bank where I ran a, a team within the, within the bank that was essentially doing two things. Number one, it was developing renewable energy projects, grid-scale renewable energy projects. And number two, it was advising people who were developing grid-scale <laughs> renewable energy projects on their financing. Okay? And, um, you know, you guys know a little bit about renewable energy. You would understand that, you know, for most of that period, the action was in wind projects, not in solar. Okay, so my team had a lot of success, you know, 
um, in, in wind. In particular, we completed in 2010 what was at the time the largest wind farm in Australia. Didn't keep that title for long, but, um, but it was an exciting project. So um, about a year ago, Investec decided that renewable energy was going very slowly, and they actually decided they were going to sell their whole business in Australia. And I thought it was a good opportunity to try and do the same thing, but independently. And, and so I'm doing exactly what I was doing for the bank before, except now instead of working for one investor, that is the company that employed me for the last 11 years or something, now I go with different investors from transaction to transaction. Okay. So, you know, what I, what I thought I would do was talk about turning panels into projects, but that's really, broadly speaking, really about development, the development of projects and that interplay between money and, so the interplay between money and the kit. So, um, you know, that's where we're going to spend, um, you know, the next half hour or so. So this slide just sort of sets out a little bit of um, um, an agenda, perhaps, for, you know, the, the topics that I thought might, might be useful to touch on. So first of all, I thought I would just make sure, you know, like a, like a good de debater, that I actually define my topics. So I do want to tell you what I think utility scale renewable energy development is. I'm then going to talk about why I love it. Those are the, that's the joys of, of this, this business. And then I'll give you the bad news. So, you know, wh what are the things that make life really hard, and particularly at the moment in renewable energy development? A and then what are the things that I think are the necessary conditions for, for, for the business to succeed. And, and then uh, I'll make some comments on, on what I see as the outlook. So just talking about, you know, what, what is utility scale renewable energy development? As I'm sure you all appreciate, it's, it's about creating renewable energy projects. Um, typically for us, um, the projects that, that are most interesting are the larger. So when we, you know, utility scale means that the bigger the better. And many of the investors that, that I work with um, will say, for example, if, if we can't invest less than tw uh, more than $20 million, we're not interested. If we can't invest more than $50 million, we're not interested. Others might say, if we can't invest we, we, we don't want to own more than 50% and we don't want to invest more than $50 million, you know, so that, like it's, it's, it, it really is about big projects and, and um, you know, I've got no experience, for example, in dealing with rooftop panels, you know, um, on, on homes. It's a, it's a very different business. It's a, it's a real business, but it's not a business that, that I'm involved in. When I describe what I do at barbecues, you know, to people who don't know anything about the business, what I talk about is the fact that it's just like property development. So everyone knows property developers. So what do they do? You know, first of all, they find a site. Um, then they secure permits. Then they negotiate, um, you know, um, well, they don't do a connection. But what they will do is they will try to find a tenant or a buyer for the property. And then they will go and they will find a builder to build the project for them. And when all of that's in place, they will try to finance the project. And that is exactly what we do, but with a renewable energy spin on it. So, um, you know, when I was working primarily in wind, it was all about People think it's about finding a windy site. That's an important part of it, but it's not the only thing. It's, it's about finding a site where there is good wind, where there is an, a, um, um, a, an efficient and cost-effective opportunity to connect to the grid. And the third thing is um, less of an issue with solar, but even with solar, being away from where people live, right? Being far from where people live. So they don't like these things to be near them. I mean, there's a, one, one of my colleagues is um, working on a project in the ACT. And he was, he's going through the permitting process. All it is is PV panels in a field, right? Doesn't make any noise, as you know. Um, 
and um, they, they told him that he needed to, people didn't want to see it when they drove past. So, so he had to screen it. So he, he put a row of trees between the road and the PV panels. Um, not, not, not so close that they would cast a shadow, obviously. And, and then he resubmitted his proposal. Now you can't see it from the road. Right? So he's been turned down because people said, all those trees are a fire hazard. <laughs> right? So, so th th there are issues. The, the way we deal with that is to be very careful about where we go. So, so you know, I, I, I briefly mentioned a moment ago, it's about not being near people. It, it's not strictly to, true. It's about not being near people who don't like the project. Okay? So, um, um, the mistake that the, my friend that I just referred to made is that he's trying to build a project where there are hobby farmers. So hobby farmers are relatively wealthy people who've decided to get a country property that they can enjoy. And it's a little farm that they don't make any money out of, it's where they go for weekends, right? That, they're difficult people to deal with. In contrast, for example, um, I've just come in from, from Adelaide. Last night, I hosted a dinner for the, the local residents around a wind farm that we're developing north of Adelaide. Right? So the first thing you need to know about north of Adelaide is it's, it's, it's okay farmland, but it's not great farmland, which means that the people there have relatively large uh, pieces of land, because you need to have a large piece of land. And they, don't, um, and, and they don't make a lot of money. So when we come and we say, we want to put a wind farm here, you can continue your sheep farming, no problem, but we want to be able to put a, you know, an 80 meter tower with 60 meter blades up, and, and we'll pay you $10,000 a year if you'll let us do that, right? So they look at it, they say, how many of these? We say, well, on your land, we could probably put four or five. They say, do they make a noise? We say, yeah, it's a little bit of noise, but if you are 500 meters away, you won't hear anything. So their farms are large enough that you can put these things 500 meters away from where they live. The sheep like it because they get a bit of shade. I'm not joking, it's true. And, um, and, and life carries on, and the farmer says, gee, I'm getting $50,000, $60,000 I wasn't going to get before. So it, it, it's, it's, it's about choosing the site and, and, and working with people. So the people down in South Australia that we're working with, they love us. Right? They think it's the greatest thing to come into the area. So that is all part of the classic development work. And when you find a site, it's about getting that right. So the right, you know, not, not upsetting people, network connection. If, if it's wind, it's got to have a good, you know, some um, uh, good wind resource. And with solar as well, that's an issue. So, you know, choosing a, a place that's got good levels of irradiation. So that's what we do. And when the developer is essentially putting a whole lot of pieces of paper in place, that's all it is. So securing a site is pieces of paper. It might be an agreement, to, uh, an option to lease. Securing the permits is pieces of paper. Negotiating the connection agreement with the host network is again a piece of paper. Locking in the offtake. So I, I should just elaborate on that for a minute because this is probably the most important point. I, in Australia, we have, well, in it, at least in large parts of Australia. So. Are you all familiar with the national electricity market? Do you know this stuff? So you know that the national electricity market runs from South Australia through to Queensland, includes Tasmania and the ACT, Victoria, New South Wales, but excludes half the country, and yet we still call it the national electricity market. But um, that's how Australia is, right? I was just down in South Australia. Everyone's talking about the South Australian national football finals that are coming up this weekend. No one else in Australia knows about them, right? but they're national finals. So, so the, the point here is the, the, that we have this national electricity market. 
And if you build a solar project, you, you're entitled to, if you can connect to the grid, you're entitled to sell your power into the grid. And what you will receive is the reigning price, the variable spot price, what they call the pool price. And that varies. Um, we can say it varies from half hour to half hour. It, it actually varies in some sense from five minutes to five minutes. Um, and whilst you will get a sum of money if you're selling your power, you have no idea what that sum will be. And if you, for, for most people, when they want to invest in a renewable energy project, they do not want to take a bet on the future electricity price. And they do not want to take a bet on whether or not we'll have a renewable energy target and how big it will be. So typically, the way the market has evolved in Australia, and I, I believe this is wrong, but I'll come back to that point. The way the market has evolved in Australia, for finance to be secured, both from banks, the debt finance, and the equity or, or ownership finance, what people want you to be able to demonstrate is that you've got a contract for at least 10 years that commits to a, a pre-agreed price for the power that you will generate every megawatt hour, right? These are large projects we think in megawatt hours, not kilowatt hours. So, and, and typically one tries to strike one of those agreements with an AGL or an Origin Energy or an Energy Australia. Less often, but occasionally there are opportunities to do a contract like that with a customer who buys, who uses the power themselves. Those guys are just intermediaries, right? They buy power from you and they sell it to mums and dads and customers and, and, and companies. Okay? So that, that offtake agreement, we technically in the industry, they call it a power purchase agreement, is what underpins the revenues. So it's really important though to understand that you can, you can sell your power without an offtake agreement. The issue is that you won't know what price. If you want to hedge the price or lock in the price, then you need the power purchase agreement. And unfortunately, a problem in our market is that the providers of money pretty much insist on that. Okay, that is probably the biggest issue we face. Sorry, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that bilateral agreements are not allowed in Australia? Is that correct? Um, no, it's, it's not correct. Uh, it, it's correct in a sense. So, so let, me, let me try and explain that. In, in some countries, I if you want to buy power and I want to generate power, we, we can enter into a physical agreement, uh, sorry, an agreement in relation to a physical supply. Uh, that doesn't happen in Australia. In Australia, everyone that generates sells to the pool, and everyone that buys power essentially buys from the pool, either directly or through a retailer like Origin. Okay? So we don't have the opportunity to contract bilaterally. However, what we can do is have enter into um, a, a synthetic bilateral agreement. So let, let me explain. Um, and th this is one of the critical contracts that underpins not just renewable energy, but power generally in this country. Uh, let's imagine you're a power station. Doesn't matter. You could be coal, gas, solar, wind, doesn't matter. And, and I am, I'm a customer. Every half hour I buy power and I pay whatever the going price is. Sometimes it's high, which is bad for me. Sometimes it's low, and that's good for me. And you're doing exactly the opposite. You're selling power, and you receive that same price. L let's imagine that you were happy with $50 a megawatt hour. And let's imagine I was as well. But we can't do a bilateral agreement, even though, in some sense, the logical thing is we'd both be happy if you could sell me power at $50. So what we do is we do a, it's a bit like a bet, but it's a purely synthetic agreement. And what I say is, you go ahead and sell your power into the pool. If the price is above 50, 
You're getting more than you bargained for, but it's a tough day for me. So you pay me the difference between 50 and the price that you get. So if the price is 70, you get 50 for the power, uh, sorry, you get 70 from the market, from the pool, and you give 20 to me. The 20 you give to me has, no one in the power market knows about it. It's a private deal between you and I. You know, it's, it's like a backdoor deal. Is that the PPA? It, yes, it could be a PPA, exactly. Could be. Not all, uh, the only reason I say could be is because these deals don't necessarily have to be a PPA, okay? I mean, in fact, you and I could do this deal tomorrow if we wanted to, e even though you're not a generator, and then it wouldn't be a PPA. It'd just be a bet, <laughs> okay? Um, but but um, if the price is low, if it's $30, you'll get 30 from the pool, and I'll give you 20. And what actually happens is that you just go away and you get your pool price, and I pay the pool price, and it's going to work out well for, or badly for one of us. And then at the end of the month, you get the data and you figure out who owes who. And once you make that cash payment, which no one knows about except for the two of us, you have endi you're ending up creating the same outcome as if we had a bilateral physical agreement. But through the market. But through, through the derivative market, right? So that, that's like a contract for difference. 100%. So there's all these words for it, right? I can call it a PPA, you can call it a contract for differences, someone else will call it an electricity swap, someone will call it a fix for floating electricity swap. It's all the same thing. Okay? So that's what I'm looking for, but the key point is, in order to get finance, I mean you can do that deal for one month, you can do that deal for one year, I, I need to do it for 10 years or longer. Oops. Okay. Why do I really enjoy doing this business? And the first point, and I suspect this is something that resonates with many of you, is the fact that it's, it's, a, it, it's about making money, but it's about making money in a sustainable way. Uh, it's about making money in a way that still allows you to sleep at night and think that you're, you know, you're doing something that's good for the world. And, and that really is an important thing, I think, for many, many people. The, related to that, is of course that you know, people in organizations like this institution, and many of you I'm sure, are doing a wonderful job in improving our capacity, our capability in extracting energy in renewable ways. Um, you're improving you know, the materials, you're reducing the cost, you're making it more efficient, that's all great stuff. I think by developing projects, I'm also helping. Right? in a different way, also helping to unlock the potential that renewable energy offers us all. The next point is a really important one, and I think sometimes people forget this. They think that we're pushing it uphill, but we're not. Actually, I think we're surfing a wave. What I mean by that is the renewable energy development business, everything is moving in our favour. What do I mean by that? First of all, as you guys would know well, the cost of generating renewable energy is falling all the time. Technology, materials, efficiency, all of that is working in our favour. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just give you a very tangible point. I mentioned that wind farm that we, we did back in 2010 in Western Australia. We got a PPA from a power company in Western Australia for 15 years that started we negotiated it in 2010, the project was built from 2010 to 2012 and the project started operating in 2012. This is not, not long ago, right? The price, it's confidential, but let me tell you, it was between 122 and 124, okay, dollars a megawatt hour, right? Today, the project that, I was, that I'm working on in South Australia, if we could secure a PPA, at around, in the low 80s, we would be able to go ahead and build it and make a commercial profit from it, right? That's not, you know, now there's slight differences, WA, construction costs, but that's a very significant move in a relatively short space of time. And, and a large part of it, just by the way, I know you, most of you are solar people, I think, but it's, it's about the materials being able to get longer blades for the wind farm 
than were previously possible to have and manufacture reliably. That, that's really what it's about. Um, the other thing is that energy costs are going up. You know, you don't have to go far to find a discussion somewhere about how energy costs are rising, power bills are rising. So all of that is working in favour of renewable energy. The government, bless them, at least the Labour government, established organisations like ARENA, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and the, uh, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, all which are helpful to us in many, many respects. Um, and, and, and I think there is something nice, I feel, about what I do in the sense that, you know, I'm, I, I'm dabbling in engineering. I don't real, do real engineering, but I talk to engineers and I need to understand what they're saying. So I get a bit of the technical stuff and I get a bit of the finance stuff and it's about bringing those disciplines together to make the project work and that's, that's fun. And, and I think I, I really like the idea of being able to say to my kids, you know, that, that project over there is a physical thing that you can see and, and I was involved, I was, you know, materially involved as were many other people in making sure that that, that actually exists today. So that's the good news, but it's not all good news. Um, th there are some real challenges. And, and I think sometimes, I made this comment a moment ago, I, I want to repeat it because I think it's really important. If you talk to most people in the renewable energy the people I market, the people that I deal with every day, at the moment they're all depressed. Right? They're all depressed. Uh, the government's this and the, you know, and, and things are not working and power demand in Australia is falling. But one needs to take a step back from the table and remember, you know, the key points about the fall in price, the fact that, you know, electricity is not going away. We're going to, you know, every day we invent new ways of um, using electricity. We're going to have things like electricity vehicle, electric vehicles that are going to increase our, our demand for electricity. You know, they, this is a difficult time, but, but, but overall um, we're in a good place. But where that becomes a real issue, the bad news is that profits are sporadic. So, so you know, just to give you a sense of this, when we did that wind farm in 2010, the profit we made from that one deal, basically we did all those pieces of paper and then essentially we sold the project to the end investor. The main investor was um, the Retail Employee Superannuation Trust from Melbourne, typical kind of investor that goes in for this thing. That's the, you know, the superannuation fund for shop assistants in Victoria, right? And they loved the deal, nice commercial return, you know, they'll get 14% per annum, low risk, they loved it. Renewable energy, they can put pictures of wind turbines in their magazines, it's all, all good stuff. So, and, and that year, from that one deal, we made some tens of millions of dollars. Not, not for me personally, of course, but for the, the bank that I was working for. In fact, the profit that we made on that one deal, and they were in the bank, my team was four people doing that work and we use external consultants. In the bank had about 500 people in Australia. The profit we made was equivalent to the entire profit of the bank in that year in Australia from all the general banking stuff. Okay? So the next year they say, so where's the money this year? And of course, even if all was going well, the fact is you can't do a deal like that every year. It took four years to get all the things in place and hit the right moment and get the PPA and find the investor and sew it all up. So you can't do that every year. So, you know, they, so it's lumpy. It's a very, very lumpy business. On average, we make a lot of money, but there are, there's a long time between drinks. And that's a challenge for many, many organizations looking at the development business. I, I want to stress that the people that come in and buy the project when it's, com you know, when it's done, they don't have to deal with that, right? They'll get their 14% because the wind will blow, right? And, and the, the, you know, it will produce energy and, and, and the, the, the off taker will pay the price they've agreed to pay. So that's not risky, but the development business, the getting the pieces of paper together, high risk, high return, 
lumpy. And, and that does make, that is a challenge, right? So you've got to find people who, you know, to invest to a patient who can take the long view. A particular issue that we have at the moment, and it's really in sharp focus, is around political risk and uncertainty. So, so I remember, you know, in 2012, I was telling everybody, don't expect any big deals to be done this year, because there's a review of the renewable energy target that the Gillard government have commissioned, and everyone's on hold. No PPAs are being done. We're all waiting for this to, to see what happens. Uh, if you recall, the 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 recommendations came out of that review the week before Christmas at the end of 2012. In the same week, they announced the election, I think it, that ultimately took place in March 2013. So we had uncertainty in 2012 because of the review. In 2013, the beginning of 2013, as soon as that issue was out the way, now we didn't know which government we'd have in, in Canberra. And so things were on hold for that. And then, of course, we had a change in government and they announced almost immediately that they'd do a new review and everything was up for grabs. And that's been 2014, okay, so far. Now, you know, from what I hear, it, it sounds like there's going to be a deal done between Labor and, and, and the coalition and we'll have a target confirmed, probably a little smaller than it, than, than it was in the previous form and hopefully that will happen within the next four to six weeks. That would be a great thing. Um, I prefer a bigger target, but a smaller target will still unlock a whole lot of deals that are just on hold because, um, you know, there are deals that will need to go ahead with a small target. But when, you, when people think it's a possibility you'll have no target, then everything is on hold. And, and of course, you know, in the previous slide I mentioned ARENA and the CEFC. Um, the fact is that their future is uncertain and transactions where they are helpful are therefore, you know, in doubt. Not, not deals they've done, but deals they're looking at. So. Um, how does the renewable energy target translate into whether a project goes ahead in development terms or in finance terms? Okay. What's the I'm, so, I'm so glad you asked that question because it just points out to me I was just skipping through the, the, key, the key link. And the key link is through the power purchase agreement. So let me, let me be very clear. E every day, as a renewable energy developer, I, I mean that proverbially, but it's not that much of an exaggeration, I ring the relevant people at AGL and Origin, or one of my colleagues does, and says, can we talk to you about a 15-year offtake agreement for our wind farm in South Australia? We reckon we can do a really good price, right? So... We, you know, as I just, you understand that, we need that agreement. So what they will say is, you know, we don't really need the energy because there's enough energy being generated from the, the, the fossil fuel generators in Australia. We don't need the energy. So we'll say, but if you don't enter into one of these agreements with us or with one of our competitors, you will not get the renewable energy certificates that you need. And under the renewable energy target, the way that it works, those organisations every year have to account to the Office of the Renewable Energy Regulator to show that they uh, bought the requisite number of renewable energy certificates. And if they don't, it'd be a scandal. For those big organisations, it'd be a scandal. First of all, they have to pay a fine. Second of all, there would be you know, um, a public outcry from many of their potential customers. So they need the renewable energy certificates. And we, you know, they say, can't we just buy a few? And we say, no, <laughs> you have to sign up for 15 years or we can't go ahead with our project. And that's the debate. And in the end, you end up with price. But today, they are just standing out of the market. And they're saying, we're not doing anything. We're not agreeing to anything because it could be that we sign up with this solar project and we in good faith enter into an agreement and we're paying you hundred dollars a megawatt hour thinking that 50 of that is for the energy and 50 of that is for the renewable energy certificate we're going to look really stupid if we if the the renewable energy certificate is valueless so um, what what penalty do they face if they don't have enough uh, recs 
So, so there is, in, in the renewable energy target legislation, there is a, a, um, a penalty specified. It goes up with inflation. So I, I don't have this year's number in my head, but it is in the order of $50 a megawatt hour. And, um, and you can get into a debate that if you had the choice of paying $50 for a certificate or $50 as a fine, which would you rather do? Right, so you know, you, you'd certainly rather pay for the certificate. You may even prefer to pay $60 because if you pay for the certificate, it's a tax deductible business expense. If you pay a fine, it's not tax deductible. So, so I'd, I'd argue that probably up to $70 right now, they'd prefer to buy the certificate. But the truth is, certificates are probably trading at 20 just right now because of this uncertainty. Okay, so uh, I would say, and, and the point of the slide, uh, I'm not sure that it tells the story that well. The point of the slide is to say that there's a bunch of things that one needs to have in order to succeed with a given project in developing renewable energy projects. We have all of them pretty well sorted in Australia, except for the one we've just been discussing the availability of the power purchase agreement. So, you know, debt and equity finance, honestly, if I could get the power purchase agreement for any one of the projects I'm working on, I would have no trouble raising four or five hundred million dollars in equity and debt in order to get the thing built, provided you've got that price certainty from the offtake agreement. Um, Ten years ago, I remember talking to bankers who said, I don't do wind turbines really work? Do solar panels really work? And uh, th th that's gone. That, that doubt is gone. So, you know, the mainstream banks will all lend money to people who are going to generate, you know, they'll lend hundreds of millions of dollars for wind farms and solar projects, no issue. So there is that confidence in their technology and, and they, they hide behind consulting engineers, you know, they'll get SKM or AECOM to do a technical review. It's pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> I mean, um, so so, so that, that, that's not an issue. The permitting environment's not too bad. If you behave yourself in, in how you go through the process of dealing with the agencies responsible for giving you um, permits and you, you work with people in an open way, and you don't try and ramrod things through that shouldn't go through. I mean, let's face it, there are some places you shouldn't put solar panels, right? But there are plenty of places where they're perfectly fine. And, and, and it's about, you know, doing that in a sensible way, very positive in Australia. We've got contractors, if you get the project all set, you know, there, there, there are a number of firms that you, can, that you know will deliver reliably and you can get them to compete on price. And, and then there are plenty of consultants, you know, reputable engineering firms um, who, you know, the banks and investors will rely on. So we, we have all of those. I will say, I'm doing a project in Thailand at the moment. Um, it's a little different. It's, it's hydrokinetic, which is, you probably know much more about this than I do, but it's taking a device that looks a little bit like a small wind turbine, putting it in a river and anchoring it and have the flow of the water turn the, turn the blades. So, um, you know, when you we went to see the council in the, on the Mekong River at this town where we were working, well, we'd like um, a permit to put this thing in the river. They said, well, go ahead. We said, well, can we have that in writing? Why do you need it in writing? Well, it's uh, hard to get run, you know, people to pay for this thing unless they know we're really able to do this. So, so you know, it's, I don't take it for granted that we have all of those things. We have all of those things working really well in this country. The one thing we don't have is right now appetite for the long-term offtake agreement, and that really hinges very much on the renewable energy target. Okay. In, in Thailand, by the way, the problem, and the um, Philippines as well, I've spent some time in the Philippines lately, the issue is almost the reverse. You know, in the Philippines, if you can build a solar project, you can sell the energy, and you can sell the energy at a really good pr price. Your, your problem is working through all of these things that we take for granted now. Right? How do you get the thing built? How do you get access to the land? How do you make sure that your legal agreements will you know, will stand up. How do you make sure you don't have to bribe people? You know, those are the real issues there. 
getting the PPA is not a problem. Okay. So that sort of brings us to perhaps uh, an opportunity for me to bring uh, all of that together. Um, fundamental point is, to succeed we need to be able to secure the revenues. Um, and that's where we're stuck at the moment, but I believe it's temporary. How we're going to pull through this is, first of all, we need to get certainty on the renewable energy targets. You know, I, if I was being quoted, I would say we have to have 41 terawatt hours per annum. That's the existing level by 2020. I, if it came down to 26 terawatt hours, a lot of the projects I'm involved in would, would, would likely still have a really good chance. Okay. I mean, the peculiar thing, by the way, is if, if, if the target is 41, we'll have that number of renewable energy projects that'll be required to generate enough renewable energy certificates to get to the, 20, to the 41. We'll have a smaller number, obviously, at 26. It's a, there's an economic argument that actually the renewable energy certificates will be the same price regardless, because it's about supply demand. If you have 26, if the target is 26 and everyone knows that, the available supply will be 26. If, you know, the, the demand will, will be 26 as well, it'll be matched and equally at 41. So I'm less concerned about a, a lower ta the lower target. I'd like the target to be extended in time. It'd be really nice if we knew this wasn't gonna fall off a cliff come 2030, which is what the existing legislation says. Um, higher power prices will help. Okay, and, and by that I don't necessarily mean the prices we pay at home, but um, you know, a lot of energy in Australia is produced from gas. Gas historically has been really cheap. When I first got involved in electricity, we used to talk about gas, $2 a gigajoule. That's what it had been, that's what it was, it was what it always was going to be. Right now, if you wanted to buy large amounts of gas for a power project, and you wanted to lock in the price for a period of time, you would not get it under $10 a gigajoule. And that's because the market is expecting that all of our gas is going to be exported at a really good price. That is really good for us in renewable energy. Um, the fact that you guys and others are working to reduce the cost of being able to generate renewable energy is another mechanism that will enable us to secure the revenues. Um, Declining demand for grid-connected power. This is a, a, a two-edged sword. We don't like declining demand because fundamentally what we're doing is selling power. But what is happening increasingly around, in Australia in particular, is that distributed power is becoming more and more interesting. So in, in Australia, our power system was developed essentially in the 70s on the assumption that power is going to be generated in the Latrobe Valley and the Hunter Valley and then shipped at high, at high voltage because that's most efficient into the cities. If you were starting from scratch today, that might not be what you would do because maybe it would be cheaper to build smaller distributed systems using a lot of renewable energy. And so where we are finding a lot of application for renewable energy is where the grid doesn't yet exist. Off-grid remote locations. And, and that's a really good thing. When you go into the developing world, some of those countries I've mentioned in Asia, for example, and others, they don't yet have their gold-plated high-voltage transmission network. So, you know, the reason we're doing this little project in, in, in the river in Thailand is because we're doing it next to a small town that doesn't have a reliable electricity supply. So it's a distributed project, and it gains from the fact that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not using the grid. And, and that's where renewable energy can help. Disintermediation of energy companies, you can probably tell from what I've said already. Energy Australia, Origin and AGL, they're fine companies. I own shares in one or two of them. But they're not great friends to the industry. They're only, you know, they, they are intermediaries. They don't, you know, with some exceptions, their business as energy companies is buying power and selling power. And if, if part of the secret for our business is to be able to deal directly with the end use customer. We want to go to the miner and say, we can sell you power. And we'll do our strange virtual bilateral agreement. That's fine. The lawyers will worry about how that actually works. But, but we, want to, we want to disintermediate, get rid of the intermediary, the energy company. Okay? 
And, um, and then this is the big thing. I think we need to convince banks and more importantly investors that you should be taking a bet on prices. In other words, don't think that life doesn't, that, that you can't do the deal unless you have the 15 year contract. And, and I, I'll tell you this by telling a story about a, something that happened to me before I got involved in power, very early days when I was working in the derivatives market. Um, I, I was speaking at a conference about the need to hedge, same issue, but it was about gold prices. And a, an American investor stood up and he said, I don't like what you're saying. And he said the following, he said, I studied the market, this was 15 years ago, I studied the market and I came to the decision that gold prices were going to rise. And I decided therefore I wanted to position my portfolio to benefit from that. And then I looked around to see which were the good gold mining companies and I chose this one, it was an Australian firm, and I invested in them. Meantime, the Australian firm had hedged their exposure to gold price. They'd done exactly what the investors want us to do with power. They had entered into an agreement to sell all of their gold at a pre-agreed price. Now all they had to do was mine it and deliver it. They were no longer concerned about the, the, the actual price of gold because they had a derivatives agreement. Exactly like the, the, the deal we were talking about before. So what happens? The gold price goes up. The price of this company doesn't react. The American investor says, you guys ripped me off. I did, a, I did everything right. I knew the gold price was going up. I chose this company, put my money in, didn't make a profit. At least it didn't make a loss, but he didn't make a profit. So, so what I want to say to people is, if you, really want, if you really believe energy prices are going up, don't, don't tell me to find a 15-year fixed price agreement because then you won't benefit from that. If you believe in renewable energy, take the, take the risk and there'll be a much higher return for you. And, and you know, I spend a fair bit of my time trying to spruik that, 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 that argument, and, and not, not with a whole lot of success, I have to say, but that, 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 that will become clear. It's probably because this market is still relatively new to them. Correct. They're, they're, they're feel it's, there feel there's gonna be a risk. So maybe, maybe as an intermediate solution, five to seven years, uh, contracts would be a good deal for them. Oh, look, exactly. So, so it's, about, it's about don't jump in the whole way. 100% yeah, right. It's about saying, well, maybe we have a shorter hedge. Maybe we have a hedge for par part of the, the output, not all. Yeah, that, that's right. So you mentioned like power prices are going up and are probably going to continue. But what happens to the point that, you know, once renewables are in the ground, they don't cost anything to run, maybe a bit of maintenance from year to year. But what happens when we hit a tipping point that there's actually so much renewables in the market and, and fossil fuels are out, therefore we have... So, so, so in a sense it won't happen. And, and the reason it won't happen is because while an operating solar project doesn't cost a lot to run, it, it, it still costs money and the, it, it, it's the cost of the capital. So, so if I'm gonna build a 50 megawatt solar project and, and let's just make the numbers easy. Let's say it's gonna cost $100 million to build. So that $100 million owes a living, right? It, it comes at a cost. So half of it I'm gonna borrow, and in today's market I'm gonna have to pay 7% on that half. The other half is gonna go to the, the owner, the Retail Employee Superannuation Trust in this example. And they're gonna say we wanna earn 12%. So you go to half of, half of the 100 million, you're paying 7%. The other half, you're paying 12%. Let's finagle the maths and say that's an average of 10. So before I wake up in the morning, before I pay anyone to keep my, my panels clean, I've got to, I've got to find 10% of 100 million, $10 million, right? So the project has to produce that. That's its cost. It's not so much the operating cost, it's the capital cost. And the issue is, that I won't get the 100 million in the first place unless I can present either an, or a PPA, and no one's gonna give me the PPA unless they need the energy, or I'm gonna have to present a really coherent argument for why this energy is required and it's gonna be the cheapest way of delivering it. 
right? So, so w without that, no one's going to give me the hundred million dollars. And even if I had the hundred million dollars myself, I wouldn't put it in. Do, do you know what I mean? So you're not going to get dramatic oversupply. Truth of the matter is, and you guys know all about these sorts of functions, you do get overshoot. So what will happen is, and, and this will always happen in power, it's always happened, it's not a renewable energy thing, it's a power thing. Um, it, it, because power projects are lumpy, you get a situation where it looks like the supply demand is, is not well balanced, we need more supply, you build, there's a race to build a whole lot of big power stations, it happened in Queensland about 10 years ago. Um, you know, the, you, you, you build the power stations and then suddenly you turn around and you realize now you've got oversupply, right? And, 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 and it's, you know, it's one of those waves, I don't know what the function is, I used to know the name of the function, right? So, so you know, it comes back into balance and, and then of course the demand increases and, and, and you, go, you go again. But on average, you, you know, you're not going to get oversupply. But are you talking about oversupply of electricity or, say, the renewable energy certificate? Ah, that's a great question. So, so in fact, I'm talking about two different markets. If I'm talking about renewable energy, it really is about the certificates. Okay. Um, if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about other kinds of energy, it is more the the energy. But it's the renewable energy, because we do have an oversupply, and the only reason we're going to have renewable energy projects is because of the target. I, I know we've got to leave the room. Can I suggest as far as, if some of you are still interested in having a chat, we can just go out in the foyer. I'm happy to take questions. But I do want to thank you for your attention. And um, I, I know there's another group coming into the, into the room, right?